So we are at the, the last message in this little uh, series uh, in the Gospel of Luke that we've been calling a Catalyst, right? The beginning of something. A catalyst is the way that you start. We, uh, it makes things go quicker in a chemical reaction. We talked about that aspect of it. But it's also the beginning of, of whatever it might be, a catalyst for a journey or a catalyst for an adventure of some sort. Well, we've been trying to see the beginning aspects of Jesus' ministry. And Luke has shown us that uh, God used John the Baptist in a mighty way to point to the catalyst, to point to the one who's going to bring the real change. And so last week, that's what Pastor Jim focused on, is how John, even though he's beginning so much, eventually has to point away from himself. And he has to say, no, it's not about me, it's about him. So John has, has had a great mission in the beginning, but ultimately, it's about Jesus, And so we see a significant shift in our passage here this morning where now Luke is recording for us the meat. We're getting to the meat of what's happening. Right? We've had some of the appetizers, some of the background information that helps us know uh, what's coming. But now we're getting to the main course in the Gospel of Luke. We're getting to the substantial part primarily dealing with the mission of Christ, his earthly ministry, culminating in his death and resurrection. So this morning, as we're looking at this idea of changer or catalyst, the beginning of something, today we're asking the question, or we're looking at this idea of Jesus being tested. If he's going to be the one who's going to bring about real change, well, we have to test him first to see if he meets the qualifications. I have always hated job interviews. You ever been in a job interview where you have some people sitting in front of you and they seem to ask you sometimes practical questions, sometimes not so practical questions, right? They said, they, I hate this question the most, or it's not even a question, but it's to get you to talk. They say, so tell me a little bit about yourself. Like, where are you supposed to start when you get that kind of question, right? Or, or the ones that I really hate is when they say, now, give me a, a specific example when you found yourself in a situation where you had to be, be a real leader in the workforce. And like, uh, you know, I'm just trying to work at Pizza Hut. You know, like, <laughs> why are you asking me this? Because that's when I would mainly get questions like that is when, it's when you're, you're, you're younger and you're trying to get somewhere in there. So job interviews, you know, have always been a little bit tough. I, some of the questions are weird, and you kind of don't know how to act. I never know, you know, if, how, how to speak to the person, or should I ask any questions? They always ask you at the end of it, now do you have any questions for me? Yeah, how much are you going to pay me, I guess? I don't know. <laughs> All right? And so job interviews, I've never really liked them. However, we recognize why they're important. Right? If you are running a company, well, you don't want to just let any old person come into your company. There's a few things you need to know about them. You need to know first, are they qualified for the position? Meaning, you don't want to hire somebody to do a job and they go show up the first day and they can't do the job. They need to know how to do it before they get there. Otherwise, you, you could have just uh, you know, hired somebody uh, that you want to train. But if that's not the thing, you want them to know either how to use the equipment that you're hiring them for to have the skill. Like, for instance, you don't want to hire a surgeon that's never cut into somebody's body before. They need that skill. Very important. So they, they have to have the right skill, but also they do job interviews because they want to make sure that this person is going to have the right attitude, right? Are you going to get along with the rest of the people in this company or not? This is especially true when looking for someone who's going to be a manager of some sort or a leader within a company. A few years back, Lara was chosen in her school to, uh, they were going to be looking for a new principal in the school. And so uh, a few of the teachers had to get together to form this little group that was going to decide, well, who's going to be the next principal? And so they uh, had to interview all these different principals that were going to come in. And some had some good things to say. Some had some very strange things to say. Now, especially if you're a teacher working in that school, you're going to want somebody that doesn't just have the skill, but has the right attitude to fit in with what's going on. It's an important question of, do you know who you're following? Right? So if, if you're going to interview somebody who's going to be a leader in an organization of some sort, you want to know who you are following. Have they been tested? 
Do they have the right qualifications? Do they have the right skills necessary to be your leader? That's exactly what we see is happening here, in a sense. Remember, think, about, think with me to the beginning of Luke's gospel. He's writing to Theophilus. Right? We, we see this in the beginning of Luke, and then in his second book, the book of Acts. He names Theophilus in both prologues, or both opening sentences. And he says to Theophilus in, in Luke 1, verse 4, Remember, he says, I've written to you so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. So if he wants to know for certain that A, his faith is grounded in history of what really happened, and B, should I really follow this Jesus person? Right? This is Theophilus taking a moment to consider the qualifications, the character of who this Jesus is. Because if I'm going to follow him and I'm going to go to the edge of the world with him and I'm going to sacrifice everything for him, I want to know who I'm following. That doesn't sound like too crazy of a question, does it? I think that's a very good question. Who are we following? We say that Jesus, sometimes we use in churches this idea of senior pastor. You've heard that before, right? I don't like that term too much. Because according to 1 Peter, Jesus is the senior pastor. At least he's the senior pastor of every Bible-believing church. right? He says that he's the chief shepherd or the senior shepherd. And everybody else who serves in the role of pastor or elder is merely an under-shepherd. So really, the pastor of this church, of Maranatha Baptist Church, if you want to say, who's your senior pastor? It's Jesus. At least that's what we hope. Because if Jesus is not the senior pastor, if he's not uh, ruling and regulating and guiding the church through his word, then we're in big trouble. So Jesus is our pastor here. We want him to be our shepherd, him to be our guide. Who are we following? Very important question. In fact, this question comes up in the book of Acts. In the book of Acts, there, you know, the church is, starts preaching. They've listened to Jesus. They've waited for the Holy Spirit to come and empower them. And then they start preaching in Jerusalem, and it starts uproars among people. And at one point, some of the religious leaders are getting together, and they're like, what are we going to do about these people? I mean, they're talking about this Jesus guy. You know, they're saying that he, he, yes, he died, but they're saying he rose again. And now they're even, there's some miracles that are happening. Like they healed this guy over by the gate, and we don't know what to do. We threw him in jail. We beat him up a little bit. And they said they're going to still do this. What can we do? So they came to a very well-known teacher named Gamaliel. And they came to Gamaliel, and they said, what do you think? And listen to what he said. Kind of hard to see this, but this is from Acts 5, 33 to 39. It says, when they heard this, they were enraged, meaning that they, they, they're still talking about Jesus, and they wanted to kill them. But a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, held in honor by all the people, stood up and gave orders to put the men outside for a little while. And he said to them, listen to what he says, Men of Israel, take care what you are about to do with these men. For before these days, Thutis rose up, claiming to be somebody. And a number of men, about 400, joined him. He was killed. And all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and drew away some of the people after him. He too perished, and all who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I tell you, Keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this undertaking of, is of man, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will, not be able to, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found opposing God. So they took his advice. This is important. Why this is important is because what we're saying is that Jesus is the Savior. Jesus is the Messiah. He's the one that Israel has been waiting for all these centuries. And the culmination in the first century, we finally get this Jesus. That's what Luke is trying to tell Theophilus. He's the one that, that the Jews have always been waiting for. And now he's the Savior of the world. But, but Theophilus might be thinking, but I've, but I've heard of other people say this about themselves. Right? There's been other people that have said, no, I'm the real Messiah. No, I'm the real figure that you need to follow. 
You know, don't worry about these other crazies. Like, that's what Judas would have been saying. Right? He's saying, Jesus, no, 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 it's about me. And, and Judas the Galilean, Judas is nuts. That guy's crazy. Follow me. I'm the guy. And, and that's the kind of world we live in nowadays as well. There's so many different ideas and religious philosophies and all sorts of things out there. Why this one? Why here? Big question. This is a big question that not only do we need to think about ourselves, but we need to have these kinds of discussions with our children. Have these discussions with people as they maybe grow up in the church and they think, yeah, the only reason I go to this type of church is because that's where my parents took me. But why should I keep doing it afterwards? Maybe it's all just hogwash. Maybe I need to follow this guy who says he's the, you know, the, the, the leader from the planet Shlapala. Why not, right? It doesn't matter what you believe as long as you just believe something. This is what we try to get our, our mindset into because these questions are going on even in the first century. Remember, Theophilus is, is, a, is a Gentile. He's a Greek, probably a Roman soldier or, or some sort of leader. And if we think about him uh, <clears throat> questioning these things, his, one of his questions might be, why should I follow this Jesus as opposed to these other people who make very similar claims that's what we're dealing with today why Gamaliel makes a good point here he says there's lots of people making these claims but at the end of it he says these other ones kind of petered out didn't they people get excited for a time the leader goes away it kind of peters out if you keep resisting this and it's not from he says it'll just die out by itself if it's just fake but if you resist it and it's truly from God well you're you're never going to be able to resist it. Do we know who we are following? If you're a follower of Jesus Christ today, why? Why is that important? And and what can we learn from Luke in his understanding of this? Well, I think Luke is giving us two ways for us to think about this. First, he gives us this genealogy, this long list of names. And second, he gives us this encounter with Satan in the wilderness. And so the two primary ways that Luke is showing us and proving that Jesus indeed is alone fit to be the Savior is one, Jesus has the right genealogical heritage, which is kind of a mouthful. We'll get to that in a second. He has the right genealogical heritage. And two, Jesus resisted the temptation to sin. Now, maybe that isn't sounding much right now, but I'm telling you, these two are vitally important and nobody else in all of existence, has ever had both of these qualifications. He alone meets these qualifications. I wasn't supposed to flip my paper yet. Number one, Jesus has the right uh, genealogical heritage. That just means his family tree. right? So uh, when we're looking at the, the family tree of Jesus here, uh, Matthew gives us uh, the side from uh, Joseph's side of the family, and then we get this one here from Mary's side of the family. In my Bible, I have a few names underlined. Um, I have, well, I definitely have Jesus underlined right there in verse 23. Then at the end of verse 31, I have David underlined. The end of verse uh, 34, I have Abraham underlined. I have Noah underlined in 36, and then I have Adam underlined there in 38. I have those underlined because I want them to pop out to me when I read this passage. Jesus has the right family tree. So what? What does that mean? Well, it means that at least he he fits one of the basic qualifications of the Messiah. He has to fit at least these basic qualifications. Meaning the promises that we have in the Old Testament were to Abraham... All right, we see that God is going to do something special through Abraham. And then we, we have that Abrahamic covenant, we call it. And then once we get to King David, we see special promises made to David that he will establish his throne and he'll keep his rule for all eternity. Right, so at least we have David and we have Abraham. And so something that was commonly known was that we have to get this Messiah has to come through this, this line. You know, there's other lines in Israel. There's other tribes. There's Levi and there's, there's Benjamin. But it has to come through the tribe of Judah. Because that's where the promises then were, were pushed through. Abraham, Judah, David. And we see this, this uh, happening. So if Jesus is going to be the Messiah, he has to at least fit this. In fact, if 
if he had other great, you know, qualifications, but he didn't fit this, he'd be laughed out of the room. And he said, yeah, I'm the Messiah from the tribe of Levi. What are you talking about? No, you're not. Get out of here. Why? Because that's not in continuity with what God has already said to us. We don't believe that God is going to have something that's out of line with what he's already revealed in the Bible. God is com- uh, has complete continuity in his word. So Jesus fits this. His family picture is completely uh, in line with what God has given to us. Um, and, and one thing that I, I found that there's, there's truly no historical evidence that anybody has ever doubted this part of it. Nobody's ever doubted that Jesus was not indeed uh, in line with Abraham, David, and the rest in this sense. But what's another reason? Luke takes this genealogy all the way back to Adam. All right, Matthew doesn't do that. But Luke especially is taking this all the way back to Adam. Right there in verse 38, he says, The son of Enosh, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. Now, we all fit that one. Somewhere in our genealogy, we're all going to go back to Adam, right? So if that's the only qualification, then hey, any of you can be it. But we have a specific marker here. I think one thing that Luke is doing, especially for Theophilus at this point. Remember, Theophilus is not a a Jew. He's a Gentile. He's showing him a few things here. First, he's showing that Jesus is the promised seed of the woman. So in Genesis 3.15, the first mention of what we call the gospel, the proto-euangelion, in that mention it says the seed of the woman will crush the head, the seed of the serpent. Now, while Mary, or not Mary, but while Eve may think that that's going to be Cain, she says, I've begotten a son by the, child, by the help of the Lord. Hey, maybe he's going to be it. But what happens to Cain? He ends up killing his brother. And so it's like, wow, I, I guess he was not the one. He was not the one that was going to do that. So God, what are you doing? And Luke is taking us all the way back to the beginning of creation in order to show us that God did not say those words in vain. He meant those words. And he's showing us how Jesus is connected all the way back there to keep in mind the promise that God made from the very beginning. And that fulfillment is found in Christ. And that's exactly what Paul tells us later in Galatians. So that's the first thing he's doing by showing us all the way back to Adam. The second thing is this, to show that Jesus has universal significance to Jew and Gentile alike. He's showing us that Jesus is the Savior of people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. And that it shows that from the very beginning, that was the intention of God, to be a blessing to the whole world. And so he's giving Theophilus this hope. This is why sometimes I think we miss these genealogies, right? I was very tempted to just talk about the genealogy the whole time because the more you start looking at these these people and who they were and how they connect in certain parts of it, it really is amazing. But this morning, the main premise I want you to get from the genealogy is that Jesus fits the, the family tree in line. So that's one of the main qualifications that we needed to see him being the Messiah. Second is this. Jesus resisted the temptation to sin. Now Luke chapter 4, and it's a parallel in Matthew. It's a very familiar passage. right? We've read this uh, a number of times. We, we understand what he's doing here. Jesus, uh, the, Satan is tempting him in a few different ways. Three temptations. And in each temptation, Jesus defends himself with the word of God. And he's able to resist that sin. But again, why, why exactly is that important that he resisted the sin? Why did Luke put this in his gospel? I think there's a few different reasons. Four that I want to point out. Why is this important? Number one is this. Jesus proves that he is the righteous Israelite. Jesus is the righteous Israelite. 40 days of fasting in the wilderness. What does that 40 remind us of? 40, 40 years in the wilderness, right? By Israel wandering. 40, that, that number 40 comes up a few times in the Bible. So it's a very symbolic in a sense. It, it wants you to think about other things that have come before it. So Israel leaves uh, Egypt, 
right? Yay, great, God has taken us out of here. God has shown us his power. He's destroyed those evil gods of the Egyptians. He's our provider. We saw this. Not only has he split, split the water so we can get through, we were thirsty and there was only sour water. God made it clean, good water. He's done all these things for us. He's given us manna. He's given us meat. God's our provider, our keeper. That should be the end of our Bibles. I'm always saying that, right? We always come to points in the Bible where that should be the end of it. There's so many times like that where we should be able to roll credits and say they lived happily ever after. Why is the Exodus not the end of the Bible? That would make a great climax. It does with Charlton Heston, doesn't it? (laughs) It's not the end of the Bible because after they're out of Egypt, what remains with the people? Their proclivity to sin. Right, that part inside of them. It gets so bad that while God is giving them food from heaven, at one point they start going, man, wasn't it really, it really wasn't that bad in Egypt, right? I mean, we had it good, didn't we? I mean, we had some good food. Oh, man, Egypt was so nice. I remember how wonderful Egypt, they were slaves in Egypt, But for some reason, they they don't remember that anymore. So their sin is to start thinking that God's not providing for us. God's not being good to us. But those Egyptians, they were, right? When you start looking at maps of the where that, uh, it's kind of difficult to do. But uh, there's there's like maps that people have shown the, the wanderings of Israel. And the question often is, why did they wander for 40 years? It should not take you 40 years to travel from Egypt to get to, to Canaan. You look at those maps, you know what they're doing a lot of time? They're just walking in circles. Just walking in circles. Oh, oh, wait, doesn't that rock look familiar? I've seen that rock before. Yeah. Why? God is, is training these people. He's testing them. And they continue to fall short of the glory of God. Sin remains inside of them. Same thing with Noah, right? I love that passage in, in uh, uh, Genesis chapter 5. It's, it's part of a genealogy, so we sometimes miss it. But it's a great passage where Noah's dad, Lamech, says about Noah, here is a, is a man child. He is the one who is going to bring us relief. Meaning that Noah's dad thought, I know you're the promise. I know you're the, the seed of the woman that's going to crush the head of the seed of the serpent. And maybe we might think that because it turns out everybody else in the world is wicked. God is showing grace to Noah. He builds this ark. God destroys mankind. We're going to start anew. Noah gets off that ship. But what remains? Sin. That should have been the end of the Bible. But sin remains. Noah gets drunk and he shows that sin is still deep inside of his heart. Jesus resisted the temptation to sin here in Luke 4. Why is that important? Because it shows us that something different is happening. It shows us we're not talking about a person like every other person. We can can go on forever and ever about times that the Bible should have ended. David, this king, right? Saul's Saul's a wicked king. David's going to be a good king. He's a man after God's own heart. What remains in in David? It's his sin. It's always the same song, different verse. Over and over and over again. There's something different about Jesus. What? Even as he's being tempted to sin, he does not give in to his sin. So this is the second point. Why is this important? Jesus proves to us that sin could be resisted. Sin could be resisted. He's hungry, right? He's been fasting for 40 days. He's tempted by the devil. Look at verse 3. The devil said to him, if you're the son of God, eat this bread. Make this stone into bread. That would seem like a natural thing. Why not? I'm hungry. I have the ability to do it. Is that really a sinful thing to do to eat bread? Later on, he says to him, uh, uh, let's see, verse 6. To you I will give this authority, all the kingdoms of the world. Bow down and worship me. It's a good thing to want authority. Jump off. If you you think you're so special, jump off of this pinnacle. Maybe God will send angels to lift you up. 
even through these temptations, Jesus is showing us that uh, sin can be resisted. Even as the temptations that he is going through, I think, are the hardest. Meaning, you know, sometimes when I'm dealing with people who belong to some sort of anti-Christian or even sub-Christian cultish type group, I have to talk about the deity of Christ. I'm always trying to convince them that Jesus is God in the flesh. But I think perhaps when we're thinking about Jesus being tempted, what I need to convince us all of is of the humanity of Christ. Do we really believe that Jesus was being tempted right here? Or do we have this pious idea of Jesus just going, no, (laughs) no, Like, like some kind of king that just is like saying he doesn't want dessert. Make this stone into bread. Nah, not going to do it. Do you really think that that was hard to say no to that? I found this great quote by a man named uh, Westcott. Westcott and Hort were, were Bible translators, and they worked on the, the Greek New Testament. But he said this, Sympathy with the sinner in his trial, meaning because Jesus sympathizes with us, that's what Hebrew says, does not depend on the experience of sin, but on the experience of the strength of the temptation to sin, which only the sinless can know in its full intensity. He who falls yields before the last strain. Now, what does this mean? He's saying, we don't know the strength of sin. (coughs) Why? Or of temptation. We don't know the full strength of temptation. Why? Because we've given in to temptation. We've given in to it. That's like saying, I don't know how heavy, you know, if something falls down, a big, 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 whatever, a big boulder or something, I don't know the weight of it fully because I'm always going to buckle underneath it. It's always going to make me fall. But Jesus knows the true strength of temptation because he's made it all the way to the end of temptation, completely, every single temptation, and he's never given in. Meaning that his experience with temptation is way beyond anything we could imagine. Because we've given in. We've fallen. But he never has. He's experienced the last strain of temptation. And he's defeated it. Jesus is the righteous Israelite. He is the true man of God. And he proved that sin could be resisted because of who he is third is this jesus proves that he is the only one who can undo the stain of sin he's the only one who can undo the stain of sin look with me at the kinds the kinds of temptations that are thrown at him the first one is bread right about eating i I always thought this is quite an understatement for 40 days he hasn't eaten and then the bible says he was hungry You know, I I go without lunch one day, and I'll say, I'm famished. No, (laughs) I don't think we truly know what hunger is. But he went 40 days without eating. He's hungry. The first type of temptation is temptation that has to do with the physical body. Uh, There's a passage here. Let's see if I can pull it up. Yeah, 1 John 2 tells us, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. He gives us three categories here. first one is the desires of the flesh. The desires of the flesh... He says, you're hungry, make these stones into bread, eat them. Eat the bread. Help the flesh. Jesus says, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. God is keeping him. God is, is, is over him. The desires of the eyes. right? He, uh, Satan then takes him and shows him all the kingdoms of the world. Look at all the authority, all the power. It can be yours. If you'll just bow down and worship me, that's the desires of the eyes. And he says, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. The third one is the pride of life. 
He says, all right, well, go to Jerusalem. If you're the son of God, if you have this, you know, relationship with God, then jump off the pinnacle. Prove that you have the special relationship with God. And he'll send angels to lift you up. And he says, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. So if we're thinking about the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life, Jesus defeats that. Why is that important? Because if you want to open up with me to Genesis chapter 3, this is exactly how the story begins. This is how the story begins. Genesis chapter 3, God creates the world and everything in it in Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 2, we zoom in to see the creation of the man and the woman and uh, what God has placed uh, in them as their dominion and as their rule. And in Genesis chapter 3, we're introduced to another character, the crafty serpent. Verse 1, now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the, God, the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now the next verse is the temptation. That was the seed that was planted by the serpent. And now let's look at the kinds of temptation that comes upon her. Verse 6, So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, pause right there. She saw that the, the, the tree was good for what? Food. Meaning what? Flesh. That looks tasty. I want to eat that. The tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes. Well, that's easy. Which one is that? Desires of the eyes. It's beautiful. This fruit is not just tasty. It's beautiful looking. And what? And that the tree was desired to make one wise. Now, what's the specific kind of wise that she was tempted with? The pride of being like God. You will be like God, the serpent says, knowing good and evil. I want to be like God. I want to be in the place of God. I want to, 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 to have the things that only God possesses. That's the pride of life. <laughs> So this is exactly where our sin comes from. When we see the fruit, we see the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eye, the pride of life. Now back in Luke chapter 4, what does Jesus prove to us? Why can he be the Savior? Why can he be the Messiah? Because he's defeated that sin which was from the beginning. He says nobody else has been able to do it. Jesus alone is the one who's been able to defeat sin. The same sins that we ourselves will fall short of constantly. We are going to find desires of the flesh that we must fight against. Things of the eyes that seem beautiful to us, therefore we want them. Or the things of pride that are going to say, put us in some kind of a powerful, authoritative position. These are the roots of, of all sorts of sin. And yet Jesus proves that he is the Messiah by defeating them. Number four is this. And this is kind of what Pastor Piper was saying in that video earlier. Jesus proves that God's word is truly our defense. Jesus here is quoting from the book of Deuteronomy. Meaning that at least he sat there and he read his Bible. His Bible was a lot shorter than ours was, but he read his Bible. He knew his Bible. And so anything that comes upon him, what does he say? Verse 4, it is written... Verse 8, it is written. Verse 12, it is said. Because he's saying that God's word has power. That God's word truly is our sword, our defense, our way that we can defeat and fight against the temptations in this world. Now think about this. Go back to our original question. Why? Why does Jesus alone fit the qualifications to be the Savior, to be the Messiah. Because He alone has both of those important qualifications. He has the genealogical heritage, which others might have been able to say, yeah, me too. 
then he also is able to resist temptation and sin. Therefore, he can be the perfect sacrifice for our sins. Which means if we are following any other person to be our, our way to God, or our way to, re, to resolve the issues of this world, we're doing something really wrong. And no other person, religious leader, philosopher in this world has ever met these qualifications. Jesus alone meets the qualifications to be the Savior and the Messiah. He absolutely does. The question is, are you going to follow him? Are you going to believe in what he has done or not? Luke lays it out for us. He says, here it is, Theophilus. I'm proving it to you. He is who he said he was. He's worth following. He did what he said he was going to do. Therefore, to not believe or to follow him is the most foolish thing we could ever do. Believe in Jesus here today. Follow him because he meets every possible qualification. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. We thank you that...